Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, and as we do on Wednesdays, we like to talk about operators. And I'm hoping you're joining us from the previous uh, live stream on OLM. So it's a good um, segue into another aspect of our operator framework community. Um, we've got Jesus Rodriguez and Christoph Laprun from the uh, Java operator. Um, group and they're going to give us an update on Java operators and all things around that. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. You can ask questions in the chat. We'll have um, a bit of a live Q&A at the end and um, I hear there's a really skookum demo coming. So um, looking forward to that as well. So please do ask your questions in the chat and um, we'll rock and roll now. So Jesus, um, take it away. Okay. Um, I'm Jesus Rodriguez, uh, Principal Software Engineer here at Red Hat and currently working with the Operator Framework Operator SDK team and also working with the Java plugin. Christoph? Hi folks, I'm uh, Christophe Lapin. I'm a principal software engineer uh, working uh, in middleware or application services as, as it's called now and I focus on uh, right now I focus on uh, Java Operator SDK uh, which uh, we'll discuss today. Awesome. Okay, uh, so the as you saw this uh, last week with Rashmi and Varsha, the Operator SDK um, from Operator Framework works closely with QBuilder. Uh, the two projects were effectively written to make to simplify writing operators. Um, the SDK team has worked closely with the QBuilder uh, Q community to, to kind of collaborate on a simple and simil similar project structure. So the projects that the SDK will scaffold look v almost identical to the QBuilder ones. Um, SDK also uses controller runtime and controller tools upstream to kind of base a lot of its pro uh, operators on. And the, the important part too is the extensible CLI. So we have the plugins, which Rashmi covered last, um, during the last presentation. And in these plugins, we are scaffolding out a variety of different projects um, and operators. So today we offer Ansible, Helm, and Go. And as you'll see, we're starting to look at and scaffolding out Java. So why, why Java? Why look into offering operators in Java? So as you may know, Java is one of the most popular enterprise languages. And there are tons of developers out there already using the language. And as workloads start to move to the cloud, it's natural that they want to also move the operational knowledge to the cloud as well. And in these operators, if you've already got a lot of your expertise in writing your applications in Java, you tend to want to write the operators in Java. Today, typically when you go cloud native, the first thing you have to think of is like, oh, we probably have to write something in Go, which is a fine language, but it, it's kind of out of most people's comfort zone. Um, this is precisely the reason why the SDK uh, went after using Ansible and Helm because we had folks that were had expertise in Ansible and written their um, installation in Ansible. So this allowed them to reuse a lot of that and create an operator in Ansible. So it's natural that we can also try to enable folks with Java. Um, also the DevOps philosophy, you know, it's typically the folks that are writing the applications, which in this case would be Java, would also have to maintain and, and do the operational part portion of this. So if they can use their same language skills, it would just make it way easier and allow them to reach success. Uh, frameworks, Java has a breadth of frameworks available and tools that make it easier to write both applications and, as you'll see later, even operators. Uh, performance. Java has 
historically been a performant language. Um, and with the operator, Quarkus has enabled a native mode, which Christoph will talk uh, mention briefly in Quarkus, and that has increased performance a ton. There's actually a few um, sites out there that compare the native Java with, you know, the Quarkus native with regular Java and Go, and it's it's amazing how fast Quarkus has gotten things. Christoph? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to add to, to what Jesus was saying. Um, yeah, so far, the, the big questions, because uh, it, it's been possible to write operators in pretty much any language, right? Uh, as long as you can have a, a loop uh, that uh, uh, can watch uh, events from the, the, uh, the Kubernetes server, uh, you can write an operator in any language. Um, and even though uh, Java uh, so far uh, has been used in lots of applications and is, is typically quite performant, uh, the performance characteristics so far were more targeted at um, server applications and that came with several optimizations that were not really suited for uh, cloud workloads. Uh, and that's why uh, Red Hat looked at improving that that specific aspect uh, with Quarkus. Um, the the idea with Quarkus is to make Java uh, cloud native, basically, um, and uh, improve the the performance aspects uh, of Java, uh, specifically. Uh, to enable fast startup, because typically uh, Java applications uh, used to have pretty slow startup um, because the, the virtual machine is optimized for long running processes. So in the cloud environment where your applications are running in containers that can be, be shut down pretty much at any time, um, that's an handicap that you don't want to have. Uh, so you need fast startup. And you need also uh, to be able to share uh, the space and the memory with other applications on your cluster, right? So uh, another aspect was also to uh, to work on uh, on the memory side of things, uh, so that uh, you can have uh, a Java application that doesn't take that much memory either. And the result of that work uh, is uh, is Quarkus, which is uh, uh, which comes with a pretty neat tagline, which is supersonic subatomic Java. Uh, it's meant to be developer friendly, as we will see uh, in the demo, uh, and it's supposed to be uh, optimized for uh, cloud workloads. Um, even though it can work in in what we call JVM mode, which is basically traditional Java, uh, it still has pretty, a lot of optimizations for that mode, um, where a lot of the work is deported, is done uh, at build time uh, as opposed to uh, runtime for many traditional Java frameworks, and uh, the big. Uh, I mean, one of the big uh, innovations in Quarkus is making it easy to uh, to uh, compile your application natively. Because uh, uh, Oracle came up with a project called Grail, Grail VM in a in a, co uh, a couple of years back, but it's been quite difficult for people to uh, use it effectively uh, for non-experts. And Quarkus make that, makes that a lot easier to com natively compile your applications. And it comes with the best of breeds of libraries and standards. And one aspect also uh, of Quarkus is that uh, people are able to write extensions for it uh, so that uh, you can uh, plug your extension into the framework and, uh, and make it uh, support native compilation and uh, do uh, whatever your extension is trying to bring to the to the Quarkus world, uh, make that work, uh, do that work, sorry, at uh, build time as opposed to to uh, uh, to runtime. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, so if we were to maybe, I, I don't know if you can see uh, very well because the, the image is quite small, on, at least on my screen, but it's uh, it's a sum up of a summary of what Quarkus brings to the table. Uh, in green, you can see uh, it's it's basically showing the the space that's taken in, in memory uh, for uh, a Quarkus application as opposed to a traditional Java application. And that's a, a typical REST application, so uh, the REST endpoint. And the second one is the REST plus CRUD, uh, CRUD being create, uh, uh, read, update, and delete. Uh, so it's basically accessing a database, uh, I mean, doing uh, basic database applications. Um, so those are typical application workloads uh, that you could have on, on the cloud. and um, Basically, in in the gray, um, the gray color shows uh, what it would be for a typical Java application. So you can see it takes a lot of memory and it's pretty slow uh, to start. And uh, in the blue color shows the Quarkus uh, version, but running in Java uh, virtual machine mode. So the what what I called the JVM mode earlier. And in green is the same application, but uh, compiled natively. So as you can see, uh, for the memory side of things, it takes significantly less memory, like about a tenth of the memory from a, tip, from a traditional Java app. Uh, and it starts really fast, uh, like uh, from 4.5 seconds something to not even a second to start up when running in native mode. Uh, so you can already guess the advantages of, of running uh, Quarkus and in native mode uh, in, in containers. And when it comes to operators, obviously that uh, that neatly ties, uh, I mean, catches up with uh, Go operators in terms of efficiency. Uh, even though you can probably still write Go applications that are uh, slightly smaller than Java, uh, than Quarkus applications, uh, Quarkus is, is competitive and it has the advantages of, of obviously being known to uh, Java enterprise developers, so they don't have to, as Bezos was saying, they don't have to learn a new language. A new language. Uh, next slide, please. So that's where the uh, Java operator SDK comes into play. Uh, because even though you have Quarkus and several projects, uh, open source projects to, uh, I mean, clients uh, for Kubernetes APIs uh, that you can uh, use in your Java applications to access the Kubernetes server and, and interact with them, um, so far, one uh, point that was preventing, or at least making things harder for people to write operators in Java was the lack of uh, the equivalent of controller runtime that Go provides for, for developers. And the aim of the Java operator SDK is to provide that equivalent uh, of controller runtime, but for Java developers. Uh, so obviously the, the goal is not uh, to have a one-to-one -one, uh, feature parity, but rather to have something that is familiar, I mean, that uses Java idioms so that it, it would be familiar to Java developers. And the end goal is to simplify writing operators and controllers in Java, obviously. Uh, it relies on the Fabricate Kubernetes client that Red Hat developed a while ago already and provides integrations for uh, different uh, Java frameworks, um, in particular Spring Boot. It provides a Spring Boot starter and uh, what we'll discuss today in greater details, uh, Quarkus extension uh, that makes things even easier. And just recently, uh, the uh, Operator Framework team has developed uh, a plugin for the Operator SDK CLI that allows, uh, as Jesus was saying, to uh, to scaffold uh, Java Operator 
uh, projects using the uh, uh, operator SDK plugin. Before you go on to the next one, um, one comment I wanted to add is, you know, like you mentioned earlier, that you can write today operators in Java just using straight Fabricate client. Um, but the aim of like Java operator SDK, just like control of runtime, is to kind of hide or at least abstract some of the concepts away so that you don't have to know all of the raw Kubernetes and try to make it easier to write and do your controllers so that it makes it easier to enter the, to the space. Um, early on, um, when operators first came out, you know, the first thing everyone thought is like, well, if you're writing an operator, you're going to be a Kubernetes expert. Um, we found that not all operator developers are Kubernetes experts. Often the reason they're writing um, operators is because sometimes the business says, hey, we need to go cloud native. You need to learn to write an operator. And a, a lot of uh, the users of that we found were in that base of, I've got to write an operator. I don't know Go. I, I know Java or I know Ansible. Um, how, how do I get to where I need to solve this problem? And I think that's where these projects are helping folks move along. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the goal is really so that people can focus on their, uh, on their business logic as opposed to um, the low level uh, machinery that is required uh, to, to basically wire everything and write your operator at the low level. And we'll see that in, in the demo, hopefully. Next slide, please, which I think. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit and greater details about the, the Quarkus extensions for the, the Java operator SDK. So even though the Java operator SDK does improve the, the, the situation quite a bit uh, when it comes to developing operators in Java, the Quarkus extension goes even uh, further. It removes uh, more boil, uh, even more boilerplate. Uh, I don't think, I'm not sure we'll see that in the demo, but uh, we can talk about that maybe. Um, it makes it, as, as I mentioned, it makes it easier to uh, natively compile your application. Another aspect that comes with uh, uh, operator development is the generation or at least writing uh, a CRD for your custom resources. And typically that's not really straightforward. I mean, if, you, uh, if you've ever written a CRD manually, without any help, uh, it's, it's quite tricky to get it right. And uh, the Quarkus extension automatically generates uh, the CRD for you based on your, uh, on your code. Um, and we support, we have a dev mode support. So dev mode is something that, uh, that Quarkus brings along, uh, which allows a fast uh, feedback loop. Uh, basically, you leave your application running as you write your code. Uh, Quarkus restarts the application when needed and do um, things uh, on your behalf so that uh, basically you don't have to stop your application, uh, do compile your code, restart the application, and and basically it makes everything faster and more enjoyable as a developer. I think we can maybe move to the demo now. Oh. There was one more. <laughs> this is right before the demo. Um, yeah. So to tie things up together, as Christoph mentioned earlier, there was uh, the Java operators plugin for the operator SDK. So in the operator framework side, like I mentioned earlier, we had Go, Ansible, and Helm. And we've had requests for, hey, I'd like to write operators in Java. Um, we traditionally, with the other three, were basing things on controller runtime. And we started to look at possibly creating a Java version of controller runtime. And that's when we found the Java operator SDK. And that made it easier to get to this point, to write a plugin to allow the scaffolding of the Java plug operator. 
Um, so one of the reasons we did this, it also helps to integrate with the operator framework SDK and KubeBuilder. So you've got a set of users that are familiar with that technology already that will want to also possibly have users that use Java together. Um, we are looking and we offer OLM and scorecard integration. So OLM is the operator lifecycle manager, um, which comes with OpenShift and it's also open source that you can install in a bare metal, I mean, in a bare Kubernetes cluster that offers the lifecycle of an operator. So we help to build bundles and integrate with that. Uh, scorecard is a testing facility that we offer with the SDK that you can write custom tests and there's some basic tests that allow you to go through pipelines and um, just do validations of your operator. And like I mentioned, the CLI with this plugin, it is it uses the same CLI as the other as the operator SDK. So if you've generated and scaffolded out a Go operator, it uses the same API to create a Java one. Um, and what we're writing out, instead of starting from scratch and going through and figuring out all of the things that we needed for Java, we know what Java operator SDK and the Quarkus extension require to create a basic project, and that's what we're scaffolding out and going from there. Okay, next slide I think is the your demo, Chris. I will stop sharing. This is the proper screen. Can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Give it a second. Try again. And if while we're doing this, if anyone has any questions, please just ask them in the chat, um, wherever you are, in YouTube or in Twitch, and we'll relay them in here. But um, try the share screen again button, because you may, if you have two terminals set up, it may be giving. Yeah, I think that was the uh, issue. It was showing before we started, so That's okay. nice. there you go. And we're back to the small font, so if you can yeah. pop it up. A I, bit. I'm gonna switch back to presentation mode, and hopefully that doesn't uh, mess there you go. things up. Okay, and Perfect. everyone see Rock and roll. correctly now? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll just stop my uh, video for now. Okay, so. Uh, Let's try to write an operator live. Uh, so let's see how it goes. Big, uh, big undertaking, right? But not really. I mean, we'll see. So I'm going to use the, uh, the operator SDK uh, CLI to scaffold my, my code. So maybe, maybe a little bit, uh, let's talk a little bit about the use case I'm trying to solve. So. Uh, I mean, that obviously, we won't get into all the nitty gritty details of uh, creating a production ready operators here. Uh, but the idea is that as a developer, uh, I want to write uh, an operator that would take my, the, I mean, an image reference. Uh, I have a Docker image uh, of, uh, of an application I want to put on my Kubernetes cluster. And I want that uh, application to be accessible outside of the cluster. So typically, if I want to do that uh, with Kubernetes, I have to create a deployment, create a service, and on plain Kubernetes, I have to write an ingress or a route if I'm uh, targeting uh, OpenShift. Uh, so in this case, we will do a simple use case where I have my app already. I'm not going to worry too, mu too much about which port is exposed. It will be hardcoded to be ADAD in this case, um, because that's quite, a, I mean, that, that could get tricky quickly. Uh, but um, yeah, so my operator basically wants to I just want to write a, a simple uh, custom resource where I, I specify in my spec, here's an image ref, do your work, create the deployment for me, create the service, create an ingress, and, and uh, expose my app so that I can access it. 
so I, I'll I'll try to do that now, and the um, I will scaffold my uh, my uh, operator using the, the operator SDK init command, uh, which starts the scaffolding process, and um, I tell it to use uh, the Quarkus plugin, and I specify a domain uh, name and a project name. So the domain name will be used for uh, things like package name in Java, but also for the, the group name uh, for the, the CRD and uh, things like that, the custom resource definition and things like that. Uh, so let's run that. And uh, let's look at uh, what got generated. And maybe I should open the project first. Oops. Okay, let's do that again. I uh, should have created a project first uh, directory because <laughs> now I messed up my directory. Let's <laughs> redo that again. Okay, and the um, SDK is nice enough to tell us that. Uh, Right now, we scaffolded uh, a basic project, but uh, it won't do much as we will see. Okay. So, if we look at what got generated, we have a typical Maven project with a pump file uh, that uh, adds all the 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 needed information to get started. We also have a make file, a git ignore, uh, a resource uh, file for application properties for Quarkus, and no no classes as of now. So if I start my dev mode, my Quarkus dev mode, um, it should uh, I should say beforehand that my uh, laptop is quite old and uh, not very gifted in terms of RAM. So running BlueJeans plus Docker plus my ID uh, and everything is not that fast. So it doesn't do Quarkus a lot of justice, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, in this case. But yeah, the Quarkus is starting now and you can see that it listens for uh, on port uh, 5005, uh, so that I can attach a debugger if I need to. And hopefully it should get going uh, soon. While that's, while that's loading, one thing I wanted to make a comment about, um, I know you mentioned Makefile and most folks that are familiar with Java noticed the pom.xml and wondered, probably wondered why there's a Makefile. Um, the reason there's a Makefile is the main CLI for the operator SDK um, for like Go and Ansible, we have a make file that we have so that you can do make build for make bundle, um, you can do your scorecard runs and uh, things like that. So to keep the, the flow the same between the different languages, that's why that make file was created for those users. Back to you, Christoph. Uh, so it started, but it failed. Uh, and basically, it's telling us the same thing that the operator SDK told us. Uh, there's no API right now. Uh, in the Java operator parlance, what you do is that uh, typically you would create an, an operator instance and then uh, create what we call resource con controllers. Uh, that uh, implement a given interface and you implement those methods and then the SDK does uh, its magic and, and uh, the operator is wired up. But in our case, we don't have any resource controller now because we haven't created any. Uh, so that's what we'll do now uh, using still the operator SDK uh, CLI and this time uh, I, if you notice, I keep the uh, the Quarkus dev mode still running, and the, the command I'm using for the uh, operators SDK CLI is create API this time. 
and I need to specify two additional parameters. I need to give a kind uh, for my custom resource because basically creating an API in, in operator SDK parlance is, is the kind of creating a custom resource because that's basically what they are uh, as far as Kubernetes is, is uh, concerned. So I give it a kind which will map to a class name in Java and, and a version uh, that's used for versioning uh, my, my API. So if I run that uh, command, um, we'll see that it should create, hopefully, usually it reloads faster than that. I guess that's the demo effect. I'm not sure what's going on now. Why, why isn't it picking up the code? It's oh, because it's a because, because it's a long demo, that's why. No, because I'm stupid and I <laughs> didn't switch to the directory I created again. Uh -huh. uh, so let's do that again. And now it should work. Um, yeah, see, it created an exposed app uh, class. And as you can see, as I'm looking at my class, you can see that Quarkus reloaded uh, the application automatically uh, while I was uh, looking at my class. So let's look at the class a little bit. Um, this exposed app class uh, is in the package that we defined. Uh, using the, the SDK in it. And it extends uh, the custom resource class that's found in the Fabricate client. And if you know Java, it's uh, parameterized by two uh, additional classes, which map to the spec and the status uh, class uh, for, the, for the custom resource. Basically, the, the Java operator SDK is opinionated in that way. Uh, and yeah, try to make sure that we follow best practice, the best Kubernetes practices where uh, it's, it's a good practice to, uh, for your custom resource to separate the desired state, which is uh, um, specified by the spec uh, property of the custom resource and the status, which is quite, which is supposed to be completely under the control of the, uh, of the cluster. Which, I mean, there are cases where you don't want that, but let's not get into that. But basically, I, I have that dichotomy between the desired state, which is represented by the spec side of the custom resource, and the current state, which is the status. Um, so if we look at those classes, uh, right now they are empty, uh, because even though the operator SDK CLI does a lot of things for you, it can't read your mind yet. So maybe there'll be a feature for 2.0, I don't know. Um, We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, so those classes are empty. So let's add, um, well, maybe let's look at what Quarkus did while we were talking. Um, some more. So you can see that first, uh, that's actually the uh, yeah, Quarkus detected that there are there have been changes to some classes, so it restarted the app, and uh, then our extension, uh, which is uh, done by the operator SDK processor, um, is. Uh, doing some work is registering. I'm not sure why there's double there, but um, let's ignore that for now. But it's registering registering classes uh, for reflection, and that's used uh, later for uh, native compilation. Basically, any can, any classes that uh, are accessed reflectively in Java. Uh, you need to register them uh, properly so that GraalVM knows that you intend to do stuff with them at runtime. And uh, 
the Quarkus extension knows that the spec, the custom resource and service class uh, have some reflection aspects. I mean, are access are access to their reflection in the code, so it automatically register them uh, for you, so that when you uh, natively compile your operator, you don't run into issues at runtime where uh, the native uh, binary cannot do the operations you want. That's one nice thing that Quarkus does for you. Uh, then it processes your uh, your controller. The controller, the exposed app controller, which uh, is not doing anything at the moment, um, and we, we're going to look into it a little bit uh, later. Uh, and it associates your controller with your custom resource, which is automatically named exposed apps that I can dot io uh, and registered with the group and version. I can add uh, your own K1 alpha, which are the, the information you pass to the operator at the KCLI. Uh, and also, uh, it's generated uh, the CRD for you uh, using the V1 version of the spec. You can tell it to generate the V1 beta 1 as well, version of the CRD spec, but uh, it doesn't do that by default. And it uh, Let's see. And then it failed because let's see what why is it failing? Oh yeah, because the CRD was not found on the cluster. So when it tried when Quarkus tried to uh, start the operator on the controller, uh, it basically saw that. Uh, I mean, when it's trying to register the the watcher uh, to watch the events for your custom resource, uh, the operator, the Java operator SDK has a mode that you can deactivate actually, but that lets you check that the CRD is present. That's useful in development, in, during development, because as you can see here, I forgot to deploy my CRD. So my operator cannot really work if the, the API is not known by the, the cluster. Uh, so let's change that actually, uh, and maybe we can tell Quarkus there's a there's an, a, a property that we can change in application property to tell the uh, Java operator SDK extension to automatically apply uh, CRDs to the cluster during development. Obviously, don't want to do that in production. But anyway, that mode uh, should apply only during uh, development when you're running in dev mode. So let's change that property to true. And Quarkus should figure out that uh, the, the application has, has changed after a while. And yeah, and sure enough, it restarted and it regenerated uh, the the CRD for you and applied it uh, to the cluster right there. You can see it got up, it got uh, applied. And now my operator properly started. Uh, it's running, uh, but nothing happens because obviously the controller doesn't do anything. Uh, so let's change that. Let's look at the controller now actually. A little bit more. Um, so your controller class uh, has two things that, well, I mean several things. But first thing is that it needs to uh, to be annotated with the controller annotation because that's where we can configure several aspects. We can configure aspects using either the annotation or the the application dot properties file. And it also needs to implement the resource controller uh, interface, which is parameterized with your uh, custom resource class. And what that gives you is that um, you need then to implement two methods, well, really uh, one method, which is the creator update resource. Uh, this other method in it is called in some cases when you want to register event sources. We won't get into that uh, 
here, um, but that's something for more advanced use cases. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to, to get into that here. Uh, and the creator update resource method is basically gets called automatically whenever uh, something happens to, uh, well, not something, but when uh, one of your resources is created or updated on, on the cluster. Um, so you can see there's no nowhere here do you need to create a watcher and, and all the low level stuff. It's it's just automatically gets uh, called here. So let's add a field. Here. And uh, maybe we'll add some uh, some logic here as well. We're going to just uh, print on that we received uh, a resource a resource so we we get directly the resource object uh, so now since I added the field uh, getting get image ref on my spec uh, I can uh, typically get it uh, I think the app push restarted, but I discovered a bug earlier, so I suspect that uh, maybe we might have an issue. Yeah, the CRD didn't get uh, generated properly, so unfortunately that's a bug I need to uh, address. So let's uh, restart. And uh, and we'll also create um, this, a custom resource. Let's create a new file. So if I look at my uh, at my cluster right now, there's nothing in it in my namespace. It is really slow. Actually, what is there? Um, let's see. So let's apply our uh, custom resource and hopefully in my controller, I added just an output uh, so that whenever the creator of that resource method is called, uh, we'll get the, the image, we will treat the image ref uh, field from the, the custom resource and output it. So let's apply our uh, Custom resource. Hopefully, this will work. And yeah, you can see that uh, the operator uh, responded there quickly. But it's getting late already. Uh, maybe I should stop the demo now and uh, open the field for more questions. I mean, I could show a lot more, but. Uh, uh, double for a lot of time, so uh, maybe let's open the field. I don't know if uh, maybe folks will have more target questions that I can answer. One comment I would make is that, as you can see, it is uh, pretty simple to create the you know the basic boilerplate stuff of the operator. And then now, like Christoph said earlier, you can focus on the business logic of your operator and not have to worry so much for, oh, you know, how do I get my reconcile function to get called? What do I need to do here? Now, we, we, we've, you know, the framework will call your create and update resource. That's where you update 
and handle your reconciliation logic and again focus on the business logic. Yeah. You can do add the logic a little bit while you keep talking. Okay. Uh, so I don't know if folks have questions or anything. I got one more slide after this. Yeah, maybe you should uh, go to this the slides. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just to show quickly the well, yeah, let's go. I just took it. Sorry. Uh, no, no problem. So as you saw, it was Christoph's um, demo, and uh, there are quite a few samples in the Java Operator SDK project and available to look at, um, as well as the Quarkus extension. And the Operator Framework SDK has non-Java ones that you could look at as well. Um, quickly, because we're running out of time, the uh, roadmap for these projects uh, and the plugins is effectively, you know, adding better testing support. Um, one of the common questions we get on the operator framework side is now that they've learned to scaffold and create their projects, um, how do they test them? They, um, there's both unit tests and integration tests that they want to focus on. And that's clearly going to be one of the big questions that they're going to ask when they create their Java operators as well. Um, today, QBuilder and SDK have an MV, ENV test, MV test, that allows the test to run a real API server so that you're interacting with a real API server, but not necessarily a full-on cluster. Um, we are looking into those types of testing for the Java stuff as well. Um, find, see what would be the best thing. Um, better dependent resource support. Um, there's usually your primary, but then there are things that you have to monitor and and effectively watch while your operator is running. Um, again, integration with OLM. So OLM is one of the key features in OpenShift for managing operators, so we want to be able to allow your operator to be run and managed by OLM as easy as possible so that you don't have to worry about all the details about it. Uh, the Java operator plugins um, that we've showed the scaffolding out, the initialize and create API, um, as Rashmi and Varsha mentioned last week, the phase two plugins, which allows out of tree executable plugins. So today, the Java Operators plugins is compiled into Operator SDK. Um, phase two will actually allow you to create your own binary and put it into the path and have Operator SDK discover it and run it. Um, this will give the project the ability to have its own releases. Um, and we could ultimately migrate it to a full-on Java application. Today, it's written in Go. Um, it was just trying to get it out with the constraints that we had at the time. Uh, metrics and webhook support. So one of the key things that operators typically want is how well is my operator running? Which, how much memory am I using? Uh, the, how often are the reconciles happening? And then there's other things about your application that you want to expose. So we're all, not only are there some default metrics, we also want to allow folks to add their own metrics that they want to monitor for their applications that they're uh, deploying. Um, and then lastly, your requirements. The things that you want to see in these projects, um, we would welcome your input. Um, there's a variety of projects that you can contribute to and offer support and or, even, you know, as simple as creating an issue. Open an issue to at least show your interest of what feature that's missing or you would like to see so that we can prioritize it. And lastly, uh, I think Diane put this in the chat. There are a few projects, Java Operator SDK, Quarkus extension, the plugin, and then we've got QBuilder and Operator SDK themselves. We meet every Thursday. Uh, 4 p.m. UTC, that's 11 a.m., I think, Eastern. And uh, there's the Zoom link. There's also a Discord chat. 
Um, I forgot there's also a Kubernetes uh, builder users and or Kubernetes operators as well as a operator SDK in Slack. So you can pretty much find us everywhere. I'll grab those and add them in in, in the video um, edited yep. version of this. So that's great too. So yeah, I didn't know you guys had a Discord ver uh, server. So that's great. Actually, and um, there's all there's a couple of questions in the chat too as well. And there's there's always um, the conversation we have about Quarkus versus Spring Boot and you know Java and stuff. And um, we did talk at the very beginning about the value proposition for using Quarkus um, uh, and the Quarkus extension instead of just a uh, standalone Java library. But um, I'm wondering if, if um, you could just address that again in the um, in this Q and A. There's a question here in the chat. Take a look. My understanding from the Java Operator SDK project is they also look at supporting Spring Boot and plain old Java. Christoph can probably um dig into more i mean explain that a little better i know from the plugin side from the scaffolding we've also considered scaffolding you know spring boot or some of the other frameworks that an operator would look like um trying not to just pick one um because i know like with go when we scaffold it out it's pretty the only thing we worry about is controller runtime and you're pretty much a free-for-all for what you want to use um there, there's always that balance of being opinionated, but also giving you the flexibility. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. To, yeah, to, uh, to address the question, it's the same. I mean, the same question could apply to any Java uh, project, right? Why use any framework uh, to do anything? Um, basically, you use a framework because it makes things easier. Um, like I said, I mentioned at the beginning, you can write an operator uh, using shell if you want. I mean, uh, bash, a bash script as long as you can deal with the reconciliation loop, uh, listen to events, uh, I mean, uh, Kubernetes events and, and uh, react to them, uh, pretty much any language you can use. Um, the question then becomes, how familiar are you with that language? Um, and are you being productive with that language uh, for your the use case you're trying to solve? Um, in in this situation, why use Quarkus? Uh, well, Quarkus, has, I mean, <laughs> maybe I didn't do a, a good job uh, of demoing everything, but uh, and actually I didn't demo all of <laughs> that I wanted to, but um basically with Quarkus you have that uh fast feedback loop when you do something you run uh, the dev mode and you write your code and then Quarkus tells you oh your code doesn't compile or in that case for the extension it tells you oh you, you didn't deploy your CRD uh, so I can't do anything or you don't have a resource controller implemented so your operator doesn't do anything. Obviously, if you're familiar with the framework, you don't need that help. But for developers who might not be, uh, that's still useful. Another aspect also that I quickly mentioned, uh, the Quarkus extension. Uh, I mean, Quarkus, if you use Java, Quarkus is the, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but uh, in my opinion, it's the best framework, uh, Java framework to use if you aim to uh, compile your app natively at some point, um, because it makes the native compilation quite a breeze compared to uh, similar Java projects uh, that are out there, but uh, not, I mean, at least in my opinion, don't bring the same level of productivity that Quarkus brings. Um, so the Quarkus extension in that case automatically uh, registers for reflection the classes that need to be. Uh, if you don't use the extension, uh, you would need to know that uh, and know how to register those classes yourself, which is not a trivial uh, things to do. Uh, so uh, the, that's one thing. The, the second thing is that it, it looks at your code, it automatically updates your CRD for you when needed, applies it if you want to, to the cluster, so you don't need to do that. Uh, and we are looking at other features. 
I think I think, you, yeah, you can, I think you you can answer, write. you really you really answered that. Um, I, I think and John's uh, who's the person who's asked this is, um, is he's, he is also a fan of Quarkus. Uh, so it's not a it's not a, a Quarkus versus Spring Boot conversation. It's just more about um, what the benefits of the web framework were. And I think you articulated that. I mean, um, yeah, Quarkus is I mean, obviously it's it's maybe optimized for the web, but it's not uh necessarily simply a web framework it goes way beyond that yeah. and hopefully we, we show that here yeah and being opinionated is not a bad thing it doesn't make it just it does and you may have a bias but um working this closely and working on all these plugins and everything and making them um uh really yeah. um speed up our our java application development processes and making these services available is really a huge contribution so Thank you, Christoph and Jesus, for all of the work that you've been doing and the community has been doing. And I really highly encourage people to try the projects, just like it says there in the slide in front of you. Take a look at them. Give us your feedback. Um, yep. Come to one of the community meetings. Um, let us know um, what's missing and help us figure out what's next to do. Um, really looking forward to um, some of the phase two um, work that's being done for Java. So we'll have you back when. Um, we get to that point and do some more demoing. But um, if you're using um, this Java operator in the SDK in production, or if there and you have a story or some lessons learned, uh, reach out, let us know. Um, we always want to hear from you and get your feedback. That's what really drives the innovation and the roadmap. Um, we're not making this up as we go along. We're really doing this based on community feedback. So. Um, real important that um, you reach out and um, log an issue. That's one of my favorite things. Um, even better, um, throw in a, a, PR, a, a pull request and make something happen. Um, that's even more fun. But I'm sure you can find um, your peers in these community meetings, um, in these different uh, servers, and especially I'll, I'll add in the Slack Kubernetes um, channels as well for this. Um, in in the chat afterwards but this is really your opportunity to um, get involved give feedback and help drive the project so um, Christoph, great demo um, and i will share the slide deck and get you guys back here in not too distant future for the next upgrade so yeah. look, all these slides and the previous um, operator sdk talk will be available um, shortly as a blog post on openshift.com or cloudredhat.com slash blog or one of the many places where we put our blog these days. Um, and it, it will, everything, all the URLs resolve to the same place. So I, I, I'll keep track of that as well. So thank you again for everything you've, um, you've done and you shared with us today and um, give us your feedback. That's the key takeaway. <laughs> come, back, come back and join us again. So thanks again, Christoph. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.